Hello there everyone and welcome to our lesson number two which is entitled Bacterial Structures. So I have a question for all of you. What exactly are bacteria? What types of bacteria are there? And are they really as bad as people think they are? So bacteria have been around uh, for a very long time. In fact, they are the oldest known forms of life on Earth. So the earliest fossils are of prokaryotes. That's a group of an organisms that bacteria are part of. So these fossils date back to over 3.5 billion years ago. Bacteria have evolved into a wide variety of different types since then. They have also adapted to a range of different environments they can live inside the human body, at the North Pole, and even at the bottom of the ocean. So that's why the learning objectives for this video are the following. First is to differentiate between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell types. Next is to identify bacterial characteristics according to physiology and morphology. And lastly, differentiate the different bacterial structures and their functions. Let us go first with divisions of microbiology. In the traditional sense, virology is the scientific discipline dealing with the biology of viruses including molecular biology and biochemistry, and viral diseases including physiology, epidemiology, and clinical aspects of viruses. In a more modern sense, virology has acquired a broader significance as it encompasses the study of ecology, evolution of viruses, interaction among viruses and other microorganisms, and the ability of viruses to deliver their own and heterologous genetic information into cells. The specificity of the discipline came from the concept of the virus as a replicative organism, very different from other microorganisms, and indeed, they have very peculiar characteristics. Viruses, including bacteriophages, are obligatory intracellular parasites containing both nucleic acids and proteins and are the most widespread species on Earth. They are ubiquitous and structurally simple. The virus particle or virion is composed of the viral coat proteins enclosing, enclosing the viral genome, which may be surrounded by a lipid envelope. Uh, when a virion in infects a cell, this leads to profound uh, changes of cellular homeostasis and, in turn, alteration of organ functions. Next is parasitology. Parasitology is the study of the interaction between parasites and their hosts. In general, uh, parasitologists tend to concentrate on eukaryotic parasites such as lice, mites, protozoa, and worms, with prokaryotic parasites and other infectious agents as the focus of fields such as bacteriology, microbiology, and virology. It's estimated that at least half of all known species are parasitic, so understanding the life cycle and interaction of these organisms with their host is often key to understanding the dynamics of ecosystems generally. Parasites cause millions of deaths and billions of infections in humans every year, but parasites of crops and animals can have equally devastating effects by disrupting glo global food supplies and people's livelihoods. Protozoa are microscopic uh, one-celled organisms that can be free-living or parasitic in nature. They are able to multiply in humans, which contributes to their survival and also permits serious infections to develop from just a single organism. Transmission of a protozoa that live in a human's intestine to another human typically occurs through a fecal-oral route, for example, uh, contaminated food or water or person-to-person -person contact. Protozoa that live in the blood or tissue of humans are transmitted to other humans by an arthropod vector, for example, through the bite of a mosquito or a sandfly. And 
We also have this uh, pseudopodia. Pseudopodia are cell extensions that flow in the direction of travel. Cilia are numerous short hair-like protrusions that propel organisms through the environment. And flagella are extensions of a cell that are fewer, longer, and more whip-like than cilia. Example of which is the Intamoeba histolytica. Next, we have mycology. Mycology is the study of fungi. Its importance to us and to ecology and conservation is perhaps uh, unsurpassed by any other branch of the biological sciences. Whether you simply enjoy the fruits, uh, bread and beer, wine and cheese of the labor of countless yeast cells, savor the taste of freshly fried mushrooms, benefit from antibiotics, sequestered from molds, curse the loss of garden plants through dampening off and blight, regret the wholesale loss of much-loved trees such as ash and elm, value the horticultural therapy of nutrient-rich friable leaf mold, or with wider horizons, applaud the recycling of biomass worldwide and their intimate uh, symbiosis with higher plants than you know mycology matters. And fungi are unicellular or multicellular. They have thick cell walls and they develop from spores or fragments of hyphae. Next, we have pycology. Pycology is the study of algae in its many forms. Algae are a very primitive plant and algae were one of the first types of plants to evolve photosynthetic capabilities which allows the plant to use its green chlorophyll turn carbon dioxide and water into food with energy from the sun. Algae are primarily aquatic plants that lack the structures that terrestrial plants use to stand upright. This works out fine for the algae, however, as they often float at or near the surface of the water they inhabit. Pycology, which is also referred to as algology, plays a vital role in biology uh, because algae are incredibly important part of many ecosystems. Now let's proceed to bacteriology, which is our focus of this uh, course. Bacteria are single-celled microorganisms that lack a nuclear membrane, are metabolically active and divide by binary fission. Medically, they are a major cause of disease. Superficially, bacteria appear to be relatively simple forms of life. In fact, they are sophisticated and highly adaptable. Many bacteria multiply at rapid rates and different species can utilize an enormous variety of hydrocarbon substrates including phenol, rubber, and petroleum. These organisms exist widely in both parasitic and free-living forms because they are ubiquitous and have a remarkable capacity to adapt to changing environments by selection of spontaneous mutants. So the importance of bacteria in every field of medicine cannot be overstated. The discipline of bacteriology evolved from the need of physicians to test and apply the germ theory of disease and from economic concerns relating to the spoilage of foods and wine. The initial advances in pathogenic bacteriology were derived from the identification and characterization of bacteria associated with specific diseases. During this period, great emphasis was placed on applying Koch postulates to test proposed cause and effect relationships between bacteria and specific diseases. Today, most bacterial diseases of humans and their etiologic agents have been identified, although important variants continue to evolve and sometimes emerge. Bacteria are single-celled organisms, and this means that each bacterium is made up of only one cell. This is very different from humans, whose bodies are made up of trillions of cells. Some species can live under extreme conditions or temperature, uh, extreme conditions of temperature and pressure, and then the human body is full of bacteria, and in fact, it is estimated to contain more bacterial cells than human cells. 
Most bacteria in the body are harmless and some are even helpful. A relatively small number of species cause disease. And they range from 0.2 to 2 micro microns in width or diameter and up to 1 to 10 microns in length for the non spherical species. The largest known bacterium is Theo margarita namibiensis with sporoidal diameters from 100 to 750 microns. And spherical bacteria are as small as 50 to 500 nanometers in diameter have been report reported. Every living organism falls into one of the two groups, eukaryotes or prokaryotes. Cellular structure determines which group of an organism belongs to. Prokaryotes are unicellular organisms that lack membrane-bound structures, so the most noteworthy of which is the nucleus. Prokaryotic cells tend to be small, simple cells measuring around uh, 0.1 to 5 micrometers in diameter, or usually 0.2 to 2 micrometers in diameter. While prokaryotic cells don't have membrane-bound structures, they do have distinct cellular regions. In prokaryotic cells, DNA bundles together in a region called the nucleoid. Prokaryotes can be split into two domains, bacteria and archaea. In prokaryotes, molecules of protein, DNA, and metabolites are all found together, floating in the cytoplasm, primitive organelles found in bacteria, do act as micro compartments to bring some sense of organization to the arrangement. Eukaryotes are organisms whose cells have a nucleus and other organelles enclosed by a plasma membrane. Organelles are internal structures responsible for a variety of functions such as energy production and protein synthesis. Eukaryotic cells are large around 10 to 100 micrometers and uh, complex while most eukaryotes are multicellular organisms, and there are some single-cell eukaryotes. In this table shows the differences and comparison between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. So, these uh, images are the comparison of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell organization and structures. Figure A shows the prokaryotic cell of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And figure B shows the generalized eukaryotic cell. Now let's proceed to bacterial morphology. Bacterial morphology is extremely diverse. Specific shapes are the consequence of adaptive pressures optimizing bacterial fitness. Shapes affect uh, critical biological functions including nutrient acquisition, motility, dispersion, stress resistance, and interactions with other organisms. Although the characteristic shape of a bacterial species remains unchanged for vast number of generations, periodical variations occur throughout the cell division and life cycles and these variations can be influenced by environmental conditions. So they come in three basic morphology. So we have spherical or cocci, rod-shaped or bacilli, curved or spiral or the spirochete, and uh, filamentous. So filamentous are very long thin filament shaped bacteria. Some of them form branching filaments resulting in a network of filaments called uh, the mycelium. Next is the bacterial size. Bacterial cells are much smaller than human cells. So bacterial cells can measure from about 0.2 to 2 microns in width or diameter and up to 1 to 10 microns in length. So 1 micrometer or micrometer is 1000 times smaller than a millimeter. So that is very tiny. So it's much smaller than the human red blood cell, which is on average about 7 micrometers uh, in diameter. Next, we have the bacterial shape. 
Bacteria can be assigned to three major groups based on shape. These include bacteria that are spherical or cocci, rod-shaped or bacilli, and spirals. Cocci or cocos for a single cell are round cells, sometimes slightly flattened when they are adjacent to one another. Bacilli or bacillus for a single cell are rod-shaped bacteria. Then spirilla or spirillum for a single cell are curved bacteria which can range from a gently curved shape to a corkscrew-like spiral. Many spirilla are rigid and capable of movement. A special group of spirilla known as spirochetes are long, slender, and uh, flexible. Next, we have uh, bacterial arrangements. Cocci bacteria can exist singly or in pairs as diplococci. So examples of diplococci are Streptococcus pneumoniae, Muraxella catarhalis, and Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Um, cocci bacteria can also be in groups of four or they are tetrads. So examples are Aerococcus, Pediococcus, and Tetragenococcus. Cocci in chains, they are called the Streptococci or Streptococci. So examples are Streptococcus pyogenes, Streptococcus agalactiae. Cocci in chains, uh, cocci in clusters, uh, such as Staphylococci, so examples are the commonly or the famous Staphylococcus aureus. Cocci in cubes consisting of eight cells. Uh, as Sarcinae, examples are Sarcina ventriculi or, and uh, Sarcina uriae. And cocci may be oval, elongated, or flattened on one side. Uh, Kukai may remain attached after cell division, so these group characteristics are often used to help identify certain kokai. The cylindrical or rod-shaped bacteria are called bacillus, so the plural is bacilli. Most bacilli appear as single rods, so diplobacilli appear in pairs after division. Example of diplobacilli bacteria are Coxiella burnettii, we have Muraxella bovis, Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis. And example of a single rod is our Bacillus cereus. So streptobacilli, they are arranged in chains as the cells divide in one plane. So examples of streptobacilli, we have streptobacillus moniliformis, cocobacilli, these are short and stumpy that they appear ovoid, so they look like uh, cocos and bacillus. Examples of cocobacilli are Haemophilus influenzae, Gardnerella vaginalis, and Chlamydia trachomatis. Next, we have spirilla or spirillum. For a single cell, they are curved bacteria which can range from a gently curved shape to a corkscrew-like spiral. Many spirilla are rigid and capable of movement, so a special group of spirilla known as spirochetes are long, slender, and flexible. So the Vivrio, they are coma-shaped bacteria with less than one complete turn or twist in the cell. Example of Vivrio is Vivrio cholerae. Spirilla, they have rigid spiral structures. Spirillum with many turns can superficially resemble spirochetes. They do not have outer sheath and endoflagella but have typical bacterial flagella. Example of a spirilla is our Campylobacter jejuni, jejuni or jejuni, uh, Helicobacter pylori, and Spirillum winogradsky. So spirochetes have a helical shape and flexible bodies. Spirochetes move by means of axial filaments which look like flagella contained beneath a flexible external sheath but lack typical bacterial flagella. Examples of spirochetes are Leptospira species such as Leptospira interrogans. We also have Treponema pallidum and Borrelia recurrentis. 
So prokaryotic cells are much smaller than eukaryotic cells. Uh, they have no nucleus and they lack organelles. Or prokaryotic cells are encased by a cell wall. And uh, many also have a capsule or a slime layer made of polysaccharide. Prokaryotes often have appendages or protrusions on their surface. And this image here shows the general structure of a prokaryote. So in this section of our prokaryotic cell anatomy, so we are looking at the various anatomical parts that make up a bacterium. We will now look at the following structures located outside the cell wall of many bacteria. So first, glycocalyx, including the capsule and slime layer. We also have the flagella, eggshell filaments, fimbri and pili, and as well as the cell wall. All bacteria uh, secrete some sort of glycocalyx, an outer viscous covering of fibers extending from the bacterium, an extensive Tightly bound glycocalyx adhering to the cell wall is called a capsule. Phagocytosis involves several distinct steps including attachment of the microbe to the phagocyte through an enhanced or enhanced attachment, ingestion of the microbe and its placement into the phagosome, and the destruction of the microbe after fusion of lysosomes with uh, the phagosome. So it uh, one of the functions of our glycocalyx is that it inhibits killing by uh, the white blood cells. Capsule and slime layer are two structures that are found in the outside cell wall of many bacteria. So the main difference between capsule and slime layer is that capsule is a thick glycocalyx layer that is tightly bound to the cell and defining boundaries of the cell where a slime, air, uh, slime layer is a thin glycocalyx layer that is loosely bound to the cell. Flagellum or flagella is primarily a motility organelle that enables movement and chemotaxis. Bacteria can have one flagellum or several and they can be either polar, one or several flagella at one spot, or peritrichus, several flagella, all, uh, all over the bacterium. And flagella has three parts. We have the filament, hook, and basal body. Filaments are long, thin, helical structure composed of proteins. Hook is a curved sheath, and basal bodies are stuck of rings firmly anchored in the cell wall. We have various flagella arrangements of the flagella. So flagella are attached to cells in different places. So as the number of and the location of flagella are distinctive for each genus, they can be used in the classification of bacteria. So there are four types of flagella arrangement. First, we have monotrichos. Mono means one. So single polar flagellum. Example of bacteria that is monotrichos is the Vibrio cholerae, Campylobacter species. So the Campylobacter species, they have polar flagella often in pairs to give a seagull appearance. Next, we have uh, Ampitrichos. So single flagellum at both ends. Example of this is the Alkaligenes fecalis. Next is the Loputrichos. It's described as uh, the taft of flagella at one or both ends. Example are the Spirilla species. And lastly, we have peritrichus, flagella in the periphery. So flagella surrounding the bacteria cell, all the members of the family Interbacteria CA, if motile, have peritrichus flagella. So such as our Salmonella typhi, Escherichia coli, Proteus species. Proteus species are highly motile organism. They show also swarming motility. And we also have the last... Uh, Flagellar arrangement, if included, so we have atricus, it means that there is no flagella of the bacteria. Now let's proceed to chemotaxis since we are done with uh, the discussion of flagella and one of the functions of flagella is for chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is the directed motion of an organism toward environmental conditions it deems attractive and or away from surroundings it finds repellent. 
Movement of flagellated bacteria such as Escherichia coli can be characterized as a sequence of smooth swimming runs punctuated by intermittent tumbles. Tumbles last only a fraction of a second which is sufficient to effectively randomize the direction of the next run. Runs tend to be variable in length, extending from a fraction of a second to several minutes. As E. coli cells are only a few microns long, they behave essentially as point sensors. Unable to measure gradients by comparing head-to-tail concentration differences, instead they possess a kind of memory that allows them to compare current and past chemical environments. The probability that a smooth swimming E. coli cell will stop its runs and tumble is dictated by the chemistry of its immediate surroundings compared to the chemistry it encountered a few seconds previously. The tendency to tumble is enhanced when the bacterium perceives conditions to be worsening or when an attractant concentrations decrease or repellent concentrations increase. Conversely, tumbling is suppressed and cells keep running when they detect that conditions are improving. Thus, when a bacterium runs up a gradient of attractants or down a gradient of repellents, it tends to continue on on, uh, on its course. Next, we have uh, eggshell filaments. So, eggshell filaments are bundles of flagella which wrap around the cell body between the cell wall and the outer membrane. Together, they form a helical bulge that moves like a corkscrew as the entrapped flagella turn and propel the cell. It is found only in one type of bacteria called the spirochetes. So this unique form of movement is well suited to the vicious environment, um, the mud and mucus, where the bacteria is generally found. Example of bacteria with eggshell filaments are Treponema, which causes syphilis and Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease. Next is fimbri. Fimbri and pili are thin protein tubes originating from the cytoplasmic membrane found in virtually all gram-negative bacteria but not in many gram-positive bacteria. Pili are typically longer and fewer in number than fimbri. So the short attachment pili or fimbri are organelles of adhesion allowing bacteria to colonize environmental surfaces or cells and resist flushing. The long conjugation pilus enables conjugation in gram-negative bacteria only. And pili are straight hair-like appendages. They are usually short. All gram-negative bacteria have pili. Function is to attach bacteria to other bacteria, other cells, or other surfaces, and not for locomotion. So we have uh, the sex pili. The sex pili uh, allow one bacteria cell to adhere to another, to another uh, cells, uh, which can actual in which they can actually exchange genetic material through the pili. And this is the closest bacteria get to sexual reproduction, and it is called conjugation. Other types of pili attach bacteria to plant or animal cells to maintain themselves in a favorable environment. If pili have been lost, maybe due to a mutation in the disease-causing bacteria, and the bacteria will not be able to establish an infection. So the bacterial cell envelope is a complex multi-layered structure that, uh, that serves to protect these organisms from their unpredictable and often hostile environment. So the cell envelopes of most bacteria fall into one of two major groups. Gram-negative bacteria are surrounded by a thin peptidoglycan cell wall, which itself is surrounded by an outer membrane containing lipopolysaccharide. Gram-positive bacteria lack an outer membrane but are surrounded by layers of peptidoglycan many times thicker than is found in the gram-negatives. Threading through these layers of peptidoglycan are long anionic polymers called dichoic acids. 
Peptidoglycan, also called murine, is a vast polymer consisting of interlocking chains of identical peptidoglycan monomers. A peptidoglycan monomer consists of two joint amino sugars, N-acetylglucosamine or the NAG, and N-acetylmuramic acid or the NAM, with a pentapeptide coming off of the NAM. The types in the order of amino acids in the pentapeptide while most identical in gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, show some slight variation among domain bacteria. Peptidoglycan is a rigid wall that gives the cell its structure and protects the plasma membrane, and it also prevents osmotic lysis. In many cases, the cell wall is very porous and does not regulate the transport of substances into the cell. Two major functions of the cell wall are maintaining shape and withstanding turgor pressure. It is important to note that not all bacteria have a cell wall. Having said that though, it is also important to note that uh, most bacteria, about 90%, have a cell wall and they typically have one of two types. So a gram-positive cell wall or a gram-negative cell wall. The two different cell wall types can be identified in the laboratory by a differential stain known as the gram stain. So it was developed in 1884, it's been used ever since. And gram staining will be discussed further in another time. And another groups of uh, bacteria based on the cell wall composition are those without cell walls and those with chemically unique cell walls. Now let's proceed to the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria, it is a complex assemblage of glycopolymers and proteins. It consists of a thick peptidoglycan layer uh, that surrounds the cytoplasmic membrane and that is decorated with decoic acids, polysaccharides, and proteins. So it plays a major role in bacterial physiology since it maintains cell shape and integrity during growth and division in addition, it acts as the interface between the bacterium and its environment. Upon gram staining, a uh, gram-positive cell will retain crystal violet and they stain blue or purple. Next, the cell walls of gram-negative bacteria are more complex than that of a gram-positive bacteria with more uh, ingredients overall. They do contain peptidoglycan as well, although only a couple of layers representing 5-10% to 10 of the total cell walls. So what is most notable about the gram-negative cell wall is the presence of a plasma membrane located outside of the peptidoglycan layers known as the outer membrane. This makes up the bulk of the gram-negative cell wall. The outer membrane is composed of a lipid bilayer very similar in composition to the cell membrane with polar heads, fatty acid tails, and integral proteins. It differs from the cell membrane by the presence of large molecules known as lipopolysaccharide or the LPS, which are anchored into the outer membrane and project from the cell into the environment. LPS is made up of three different components. So first is the O antigen or the O polysaccharide, which represents the outermost part of the structure. Second is the core polysaccharide. And three, or lastly, is the lipid A, which anchors the LPS into the outer membrane. So gram-positive bacteria have lots of peptidoglycan in their cell wall which allows them to retain crystal violet dye so they stain purple to blue and gram-negative bacteria on the other hand have less peptidoglycan in their cell wall so cannot retain the crystal violet dye which is the primary stain so they stain red to pink and this table shows the comparison of gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls Bacteria of the genus Mycobacteria, so the organisms which cause tuberculosis and Hansen's disease or commonly known as the leprosy, so are Mycobacteria, so do not stain easily with the gram stain. 
because these organisms are stained with the acid fast stain and they are called acid fast organisms so they are uh, acid fast organisms because they contain waxy lipids in their cell walls or the so-called mycolic acid and the genus nocardia is also acid fast and this stain is also used to identify certain parasites like cryptosporidium Another atypical cell wall, so to speak, would be found in those bacteria which do not have cell walls. So the molecules which include mycoplasma and urea plasma. Next, let's proceed to the structures uh, internal to the cell wall. First, we have the plasma or the cytoplasmic membrane. So it provides protection for a cell. It also provides a fixed environment inside a cell and that membrane has several different functions. One is to transport nutrients into the cell and also to transport toxic substances out of the cell. Another is that the membrane of the cell, which would be the plasma membrane, will have proteins on it with, uh, which interact with other cells. Composition of the plasma or the cytoplasmic membrane is is the phospholipids and proteins. So plasma or the cytoplasmic membrane, it is a dense gelatinous solution of sugars, amino acids, and salt. And mostly uh, the composition of this plasma membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane is 70 to 80% of water. And it serves as a solvent for materials used in all cell functions. Next, we have the nucleoid or the chromosome. It is a mass of genetic material or the DNA. So the nucleoid functions much like the nucleus in eukaryotic cells in that it is the regulatory center of the prokaryotic cell. The region regulates the growth, reproduction, and function of the prokaryotic cell. So the previously mentioned proteins and enzymes are essential in these processes. Next, we have plasmids. So it is a small circular piece of DNA that is different than the chromosomal DNA, which is all the genetic material found in an organism's chromosomes. It replicates independently of chromosomal DNA. Plasmids have many different functions. So they may contain genes that enhance the survival of an organism either by killing other organisms or by defending the host cell by producing toxins. Some plasmids facilitate the process of replication in bacteria. Since plasmids are so small, uh, they usually only contain a few genes with a specific function as opposed to a large amount of non-coding DNA. Next, we also have the ribosomes. Ribosomes are microscopic factories found in all cells, including bacteria. They translate the genetic code from the molecular language of nucleic acid to that of amino acids, in which amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Proteins are the molecules that perform all the functions of cells and living organisms. Next, we have the storage granules. So they are an important component of metabolism in many organisms spanning the bacterial, eukaryotes, and archaeal domains. So these granules are the parts of the cell that store the cell's energy reserves as well as other important metabolites. So examples of storage bodies are glycogen, poly B hydroxybutyrate, gas vesicles for floating, sulfur, polyphosphate granules, and metachromatic granules. Next, we have the endospores. Endospores are spores that form uh, within the cells, mainly in bacteria. These spores are formed uh, within bacterial vegetative cells or mother, mother cells known as the spore sporangia. Endospores ensure the survival of bacteria in adverse environmental conditions, such as nutrient deficiency, carbon and nutrient, and overpopulation. 
and there are two processes involving the endospore so we have sporulation formation of endospores and germination in which they return to their uh, to their vegetative growth and endospores uh, can withstand extremes in heat drying freezing radiation and chemicals and that would be all for our lesson number two and then these are the various references used for this video. And thank you so much everyone for listening. God bless you all.